Director Brennan, I start with you. The Legal process is something that we've all, you know, people outside of, of, of the legal system have become familiar with just by virtue of the nature of Trump's presidency and now his sort of former presidency. And one thing is always true. It takes a lot longer for the process to catch up with his pace and pattern of criminality and misconduct. But it seems that that catching up is very much what is underway this week. Your reaction? Well, Nicole, I think it's uh, long overdue that the Department of Justice and the FBI uh, be able to pursue every investigative lead to determine accountability for what clearly was, I think, criminal behavior that led to these documents uh, finding their way to Mar-a-Lago. But also, I think it's critically important in order to be able to determine exactly what of uh, the, the intelligence community's source and methods really have been put at risk because of that careless disregard for the classification of these documents. And so I was uh, very relieved to hear that the, the decision was made by the appeals court that the special master it was really it was an inappropriate uh, determination on the part of the lower judge. Uh, and so moving forward with this now, I think it's going to be able to address both accountability as well as trying to understand exactly what the compromise might have been. But one thing I need to point out, uh, Nicole, is that there has been grievous damage done already yeah. as a result of these documents finding their way to Mar-a-Lago. The message it sends to uh, human sources around the globe who work very closely with the U.S. intelligence community is that they have to wonder whether or not the information they provide is going to be protected the way it should be, as well as to all those intelligence and security services around the globe that share their information with us. So again, I'm very glad that the investigation is able to move forward, the determination about what might have been compromised. But uh, clearly, what Mr. Trump did has already caused, I think, significant damage to U.S. national security. I mean, I want to follow up with you on that, Director Brennan. I, I was filling in for Brian Williams on the 11th hour in January of 2017 when General Michael Hayden said the very same thing about Trump's conduct during the transition, before he ever became president, and he was likening the intelligence community to Nazis. Um, when you look at the time he had to damage the intelligence product and the tight-knit intelligence community, the Five Eyes group, or, or really anyone that shares intelligence with us. Do you think we'll ever have an accurate assessment of the damage that he did? I don't think we'll ever have a complete assessment of the damage, but I do think as time goes on, we'll have a better sense of it. Not only did he disparage the intelligence community, the professionals and the profession itself, which I think was very dispiriting in terms of the morale of these uh, officers uh, throughout the intelligence community, but also he didn't really care about intelligence. And one of the things that intelligence professionals want to know is that what they do matters. The sacrifices that they make matters. The intelligence that they collect really has uh, makes a contribution to our national security. And so not only did he do things that were very uh, undermining of the intelligence uh, community processes, but also I think he disregarded the intelligence input that was provided uh, to him uh, in terms of what he was not uh, sort of interested in, in finding out. You know, Andrew Weissman, this isn't exactly the conversation that, that I planned, but it's probably a more important one. And, and I, I guess what I want to ask you is, you know, it fell to you to investigate some specific questions about um, Trump and his former campaign head, Paul Manafort, and his ties to Konstantin Kalimnik and, and, and all sorts of questions of criminality. Manafort was, was guilty of them. He eventually received a pardon from Trump. But on this bigger question of reckless disregard for state secrets, is that something that a prosecution could introduce to counter all of what I'm sure will be defenses about a president's absolute right to declassify whatever he wants? It, it could be relevant to a criminal case, but I don't think it's at all necessary. Um, and I would imagine that there's a, there's a lot of interest when you're a criminal prosecutor in keeping a case narrow and focused to the elements of the crime. And especially if you're talking about the Mar-a-Lago documents case, which is so clean and neat um, in terms of being able to bring that case, I think you probably wouldn't want those um, kinds of distractions. Um, but that is not to say I... I don't disagree with 
anything at all that uh, Director Brennan uh, is saying. And uh, I couldn't, I just couldn't agree more with the idea that there is damage now being done to uh, our national security interests by the conduct of the former president, both when he was in office, but what he has done since he since he's been out of office. And essentially what has happened in the last two days is a real step forward to what John correctly says is long overdue accountability. Um, so when you have um, the, the information now that uh, both Pat Cipollone and Pat Philbin have gone into the grand jury, and I think it's particularly interesting that Dan Scavino is now going to be in the grand jury after he committed contempt of the January 6th committee. I, I think those are all really important developments, um, and it tells you the power of the grand jury and, once again, a power of, of judges in holding uh, Trump to the same standard as anyone else. You now see it with the chief justice, uh, a chief judge of the D.C. court, Beryl Howell, and you saw it in the 11th Circuit yesterday. Um, let me focus on that with you then, Andrew Weissman, the strength of the Mar-a-Lago documents case. You mentioned a couple of the witnesses um, who've been before the grand jury on that. Here, here's, here's our um, compilation. Uh, Christina Bob, she's the Trump attorney who seemed to have lied to the federal government about the documents that were there. Akash Patel, um, he was designated by Trump to deal with NARA. We understand him to have some limited immunity in this investigation. Walt Nauta, that's Trump's personal aide at Mar-a-Lago. He was seen on those surveillance tapes moving boxes. There's been reporting in the Washington Post and the New York Times that suggests he was less than truthful with investigators. Pat Zipaloni, um, who a judge cleared uh, to go in and answer questions. Um, his deputy, Patrick Philbin, Molly Michael, Trump's executive assistant, who went with him to Mar-a-Lago, Dan Scavino, as you just mentioned, Andrew, William Russell, another White House aide, and William Harrison, another White House aide. Um, they might have been involved in things like moving and packing, but we don't know that at this point. Um, Andrew Weissman, it's, it seems like with that group of individuals, you will absolutely get to the bottom of what happened with the classified documents taken to Mar-a-Lago. Sure. Let me just focus on on the three. Uh, first, um, Pat Cipollone and Pat Philbin. They were uh, a counsel at the White House. They were also designated by the former president as being his representatives to the National Archives. Um, I strongly suspect what they said that they would be willing to answer if the court allows them is any of their communications directly with Donald Trump or with Donald Trump, either as president or as, as the former president. And they will be able to testify about those conversations. What did they tell him about those documents, whether they were presidential records and whether they needed to be returned? That could be extremely damning testimony um, because those are both responsible lawyers. The law on this is very clear. It is highly unlikely that they told him anything other than what the law um, is So th that could be just an incredibly important development where he hears from the people who he himself designated to represent him in connection with the archives saying what the law is and where those documents should be. That would go a long way to proving the critical element in a criminal case, which is the intent of the defendant, which has to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. And then Dan Scavino, by all accounts, had enormous access to what Donald Trump knew and was reporting out right after the uh, election. And we'll be able to speak to Donald Trump's state of mind at that point in terms of whether he lost the election um, and whether he was tweeting out or on Truth Social communicating uh, facts that were not true and that he knew to be uh, untrue.